My name is Shannon Siegel. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the organizing director at EVP, but I think I'm gonna take what Therese said and said. I think I'd like to think of myself as the person that makes the action happen. Um, I think that's a much better title. For today, I'm gonna pull back the curtain a little bit and give some backup information for what everyone has been saying so far about what we do at EVP and why we do it. I've got a lot of data I'm gonna run through pretty quickly, but we'll have some time for a Q&A. So if you wanna write down your question as we're going and send it in the chat, I'll stop sharing my screen um, at the end and I'll be able to see the questions there. So at the Environmental Voter Project, we do one thing and we try to do it really well. <coughs> we contact people who care a lot about climate and the environment and we help them become better voters. Why do we do that? Because of polls and data like you're looking at in front of, in front of you right now. So we ran with Beacon Research, um, a multi-state like battleground state poll where we asked voters, like people who were registered voters, what their top priority was when deciding who to vote for. As you can see highlighted in this darker green, only 4% of people who were registered voters in this poll said climate or the environment. Mind you, this is about double the number we were looking at when we got started back in 2016. So we've got good progress. I hope we keep doubling. But this is why, this is the crux of why we do what we do, right? If you're someone who's running for office or you're building a campaign or you're in office and you wanna make sure you get reelected, you need to focus on the priorities of the voters. Like not just your general constituents, but the people that actually vote, because those are the ones that are gonna decide whether or not you stay elected. So if you're someone you know, running for office and you need to decide what your platform and your top issues are, you have to prioritize the issues that are at the top of this list if you wanna get elected and stay in office, right? No matter how much you might care about climate, you probably can't afford to make it a big part of your platform because it's not a big part of what the actual voters are caring the most about. At EVP, we are working to get more people who care about climate to vote. So rather than convincing people who list inflation or economy or reproductive rights to care more about climate, instead we're focusing on people who already care about climate but don't vote. And we're getting them to vote and to vote consistently because ultimately all of this is hard work but it's a lot easier to get someone who already agrees with you to start voting than it is to get a voter who cares a lot about a different issue to care more about climate. So we do this with a long-term electorate building approach, just like you heard Frances speak about how she's participated um, and work with us every year since 2018. We don't only do work in these even year big elections. Instead, we focus on identifying these particular group of voters who are registered to vote, care a lot about climate, but who don't vote consistently. And then we contact them with canvassing door-to-door -door calls, direct mail, digital ads, and previously texting to give them a very simple message that encourages them to vote in every single election. So that's local, state, federal, special, runoff, um, general, any type of election a voter can vote in, we're going to contact them. And that's for this third point because of the habit reinforcement aspect. We know that you can't build a habit if you only do something every two years or every four years. Um, if that was the case, I would say I had a habit of going to the gym, but that would not be an honest thing to say. Instead, we know that building a habit is doing something as much as you can or doing it regularly. So we check voter files to see which of our target environmentalists voted. We thank the people who do vote, which helps kind of that, that extra level of um, accountability. And then we start mobilizing them again for their next election. So we don't only focus on the elections where there's a big climate candidate or a climate you know, ballot question. We are getting environmentalists to be super voters, the types of voters that you're not gonna be able to ignore if you're running for office. And as Therese mentioned, 
we use very specific messaging. So we use the latest behavioral science, the latest, you know, get out the vote best practices, both from other progressive organizations and from our own research and studies to determine what messages are most effective. We don't go with our gut on this. If we went with our gut, we would say, you care a lot about climate. It's really, really important. You know, we only have so many years to make a difference. Make sure you vote. Our, the data actually suggests that that is not effective. People don't vote because of rational, logical reasons. Instead, they largely vote because of emotional reasons. So that's the types of messaging that we use um, for our work and that we encourage other awesome organizations like ESD to use. So here's some examples. If you were doing phone banking with us today, this is very similar to the message that you would use, this top plan making and social pressure message. So it's going to say the election is on date and early voting has already begun. Will you be voting? And then we list out their voting options. So later this week, we're launching a campaign into Virginia. Early voting starts on the 24th. So on the 24th, I'm going to say the Virginia state election is on November 8th and early voting has already begun. Will you be voting early in person, by mail, by ballot drop-off, or on election day? This is doing two things. One, it's helping with plan making, which we all know is very effective. I'm not just saying, will you be voting? I'm saying, will you be voting with this option, this option, or this option? And that's helping that voter inadvertently start making a voting plan, even if they haven't thought about it yet. Once someone has made an actual plan, they're much more likely to follow through on that plan. The other aspect here is called social pressure. Um, this is positive social pressure. This is essentially saying, here's a norm, here's an, a societal expectation, are you going to follow through on it? So rather than saying, as I mentioned before, are you going to vote? We are assuming that this person is going to vote, even though their voting record does not suggest that. We're implying that everyone's voting, but the expectation is that they're voting. And instead we're asking them which method they're going to use. So that soft social pressure is the, I'm going to assume that you're voting and you're gonna know that voting is a good thing. So you're gonna tell me what type of method you're going to use even if you haven't thought about it before. A next message that this was from one of our own studies um, that you can find on our website in the link I put in the chat, friends and family norm enforcement. So as I mentioned before, we are only talking to people that are not very good voters. So they don't vote very much. We know that they're the ones that need the voting help. However, a really surprising result of one of our studies showed that rather than telling the voter themselves to vote, when we encourage them to tell other people to vote, that actually made them more likely to vote and probably the other people in their life too. We, we can't measure that type of impact, but it was very interesting. So what you'll see here is, uh, this is from an experiment we did in Pennsylvania in 2021. Please make sure your friends and family vote in the blank election on date. Would you like information on voting early in person by mail, by Dropbox or on election day? So again, even though what we're really doing is targeting the voter, we want that person to vote. We found that when we essentially deputized this person to have to tell other people to vote, <clears throat> it increased their voting um, rates as well. So we saw a statistically significant higher rate of turnout for the people that got this friends and family message. So as you're crafting your messaging for this year, um, and this is something we've worked really closely with the Pennsylvania team on, think about if there are ways that you can deputize that person to be a messenger for other people in their life. You're saying, you are a trusted person for your friends and family. You are a model for your friends and family. It's your job to make sure they vote. Most people don't wanna be hypocritical, right? If they're telling other people to vote, they're gonna make sure that they're voting as well. And then this last message, this is a sample from one of our postcarding campaigns. So Francis, uh, anyone else who participated, this will look really familiar. Loss aversion, we use this a lot in our mail. 
thanks for being a good voter in 2020. So this goes to people who we know voted in 2020, but don't tend to vote in midterms. So we look at their voting record, we see that they did vote in 2020, and we thank them for it. Thank you for being a good voter in 2020. Keep your good voting record by voting in the date election. So keep your good voting record by voting in the November 8th New Mexico election. This is using a technique called loss aversion. I'm, I'm sure we've all experienced something like this. If you feel like you've already done most of the work, you're much more likely to like cross the finish line, right? Than if you feel like you have to start from scratch. So loss aversion um, is this technique that's making someone feel like they've already done part of the work. So they've already voted in 2020. They're already a good voter. They don't wanna mess that up. They don't wanna be a bad voter. So it's helping them keep their good voting status. And this is another one of those effective messages. And um, as other several folks have mentioned, we do measure our results. So in the six years since we first got started, we've helped turn over a million people from these infrequently voting environmentalists to regularly voting super environmentalists. So these were people that once voted so inconsistently that they got on our contact list in the first place and are now voting in at least their most recent local, state, and federal election since we've contacted them. Here's where you can also see the 17 states where we're actively turning out voters. As Francis alluded to, um, you don't need to be in one of these states. You can be in Maryland, you can be in Wisconsin, you can be in Minnesota. We are just contacting folks in the states in either light or dark green because these are the 17 states where we've had the highest rates or where we see the highest rates of these unlikely to vote environmentalists. So that's not to say that other states like Wisconsin um, aren't important. Of course, they're important. It just means that EVP is not going to have the biggest impact there. So we focus your efforts on places where we know we have these high proportions of low propensity environmental voters where you can make a big impact. Out of the 17, here's a few of the states where we have the highest opportunities for impact. So states where the percentage of you know, 2018 ballots cast, so how many ballots were cast in that last midterm. If all of our targets voted in the midterm, this is what percentage of the electorate they would make up. So these numbers are huge. Look at New York, look at Colorado, look at New Mexico, these, you know, Arizona. These are states where if all of our target environmentalists voted in this midterm election, they would be making up double digit percentages of the electorate. That's massive. If all of a sudden you're running for office and you get this like unexpected 15% higher, you know, rate of turnout, you're going to pay attention to who those people are and you're gonna start feeling like you need to do something about them. In this list on the, on the right here, you'll see which competitive federal races there are this year, um, just for context. So not that these other states that aren't on this list aren't important, they are, but these are just the states where we're expecting some tight races and we have these really high proportions of environmental voters so that, you know, as, um, I think Paul mentioned, Therese mentioned, uh, uh, Francis mentioned, where after the election, our voters could make up the margin. That's huge. We're not telling people which way to vote. We're not telling them to you know, vote for one candidate or the other. This is just to illustrate how impactful these numbers of people could be if they turned out. And that's what we're gonna do this year. And it's what we hope you'll help us with this year. So as you've heard a little bit, it's very important to me and to the whole team that our volunteers have a good experience. We can give you all the data in the world for why something's important, but if you hate doing it, you are probably not going to do it. Um, so we really, really value the volunteer experience and we only ask our volunteers to do things that we can measure afterwards. So we know from previous experiments what we think is going to work. That's what we ask our volunteers to do. But then after the election, we'll still report back to you on the results of our work.
So what I'm going to ask you now is not to wait. It is a perfect moment to get involved. We're just ramping up. Early voting is about to begin in Virginia. That's the first of all our 17 states where early voting begins. It starts on September 24th, right? Election day is not a month and a half away. Election day is starting this week. So you can learn more about our results uh, as I put in the chat. You can sign up to contact environmental voters with us. So at the Get Involved link on our website. If you're interested in door-to-door -door canvassing, if you're in or near one of our 17 states, you can sign up. It's also on our website, but here's the shortcut link, um, environmentalvoter.org slash canvas. And you can get other folks involved. I know Frances mentioned um, at the end of what she was saying that a big part of her work this year is helping get others involved. That can be your role as well. You are trusted members of your chapters, of your teams, of your community. So invite someone else to join you. When they know there's gonna be a familiar face, they're more likely to show up because um, of that social pressure. They know you'll know if they don't show up. So I'm gonna pause here. I know that was a lot of information really quickly. Um, evidently my, my cat is very interested in what we're talking about as well. Um, but if folks have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat um, or you can raise your hand and uh, we can answer some questions. I have a question. Um, Shannon, thank you for a, a, um, a very precise and um, well-crafted uh, statement of uh, EVP's activities. In the uh, postcard writing, um, I guess what I'm wondering is, uh, it, is there way, is, there, is it appropriate in your view to uh, share with those who are recipients of either cards or letters, the fact that we know that they're environmental voters, uh, that we uh, that there are public records that uh, uh, give us indications of how people vote, and we are also environmental voters, and that's why we're writing you. Yep. Yeah. Great question. So, with our letter writing we do, or like our postcard writing, we do not include that type of messaging, um, largely be for a couple of reasons. One, postcards are a one-way conversation, right? We don't, we don't get the opportunity to get questions. So we want to keep the message as to the point as possible, and then just point these voters in the direction of more information. The second reason is because, um, some really interesting studies around postcards showed that a one to two sentence message is more effective than a four to five sentence message. So we've really focused on that to keep our message as short as possible um, for an effectiveness point. However, with our calls, um, we do have a script response available for if somebody says, why are you calling me in particular? You know, what are you communicating with me for? So, um, Here's kind of what we say to that. I'll put it in the chat and read it out loud as well. Someone says, why are you contact, you know, why are you asking for me and not my spouse? Or why are you asking for me and not somebody else? We'll say that we're a nonpartisan nonprofit dedicated to increasing voter turnout. We reach out to voters who we think might care about the environment to make sure you know about your voting options. We're not a campaign. We just help people remember to vote. So we we use that type of language we don't like to use the more like kind of big brother creepy message of like we've identified you exactly because we know you're really really likely to care about climate it's not a secret people can go to our website they'll see our name and our link um, on any materials that we communicate with them with and they can see that but um we're really focused on keeping the message really lean uh, for these voter conversations to make sure that we're, we're focusing on the, the most important information there. Thank you. Great question. Um, I see a good question from Jeffrey in the chat. So how do we identify these environmental voters? Good question. Um, we use what's called predictive analytics to identify these voters. So. The first thing that we do is we work with data analytics professionals to run these really, really large scale polls 
on surveys of people in all of the states where we're active. So they pull people who are already registered to vote. That's how they get their information from the voter file. And we ask them really simple questions. Um, basically the question is, here's the top 15 issues in the country today, just like you saw on, on that slide with the poll. What's most important to you when you vote? That's what we ask them. So once we get enough people in each of these states who say climate or the environment, that's the issue that they pick for number one, we are able to look at consumer and behavioral data points associated with those voters that are appended to each person in the voter file. So these consumer and behavioral data points are again publicly available and they're the same types of things that are used when you get an insurance quote or when you get a targeted advertisement online. And they include things like, are you a member of any you know, public organizations or professional organizations? What type of car are you registered as driving? Do you live in an urban area or rural or suburban area? So we get all these people who say carbon or the environment, and then we see all these consumer and behavioral data points associated with each person. And that allows us to essentially create a map to see what these voters have in common. Once we can find kind of uh, this, we create what's called a predictive model that could use these polls that we've already conducted and predict out for someone who did not answer our survey, how likely they are to fit into our model. So how likely they are to, keep, to be a top issue climate voter. So then we've got all registered voters in the state and each, each one gets a score from us, zero to 100, based on how likely they are to prioritize climate as their number one issue. We've got registered voters, we know they care about climate. And then the last piece is we actually take out everybody with a really good voting record. So we take out the people that are already voting all the time. And instead we're focusing on the people that are considered low propensity voters. So that means people that don't vote as much as they could be voting. So um, that's how we identify folks. That's how we identify them in all of our states. It is a predictive model. So of course it's never going to be 100% perfect, um, but we do test the model afterwards and we you know, contact the people who didn't answer our survey to ask them the same questions. And um, overall we are very effective at that work. Thank you, good answer. Thank you, I know it's a little technical on there, but um, hopefully that, that made sense for folks. Great, um, so I see a question, <clears throat> excuse me, from Mark. Will your message be changing as we get closer to the election? Very good question. So yes and no. As we get closer to the election, we are going to be using the same techniques that I mentioned before. So loss aversion, plan making, social pressure, that's not going to change. But there are a couple ways that our message will change as we get closer to the election. One, we don't just contact people once. We try to contact them multiple times. So for example, for Virginia, we have a two, at least a two-pronged approach planned because we have this really long window. We're calling voters starting on the 24th to ask what method they plan to use to vote. Then we can look at the results of those people and we can do follow-up communications based on what they said. So for people that said they wanted to vote early, we can look at the voter file closer to the end of early voting. We can see who has not yet voted and then we will contact them again and we'll say, hey, in a previous conversation, you let us know that you were planning to vote early. Early voting ends on Friday. Um, can I provide you with additional information about voting early or voting on election day? So whenever possible, we will reference an earlier conversation with a voter because we know that really doubles the, or maximizes the impact because they know someone's paying attention and they're reminded of a previous, essentially, promise that they made. So we will use messaging when states update their voter files regularly that says, you know, the election is on Tuesday and it looks like you haven't voted yet. Can I give you information about election day voting? If they say, I already voted, we'll say, you know, I already voted by mail. 
okay, great. We really encourage you to track your ballot at this link to make sure that it arrives on time for election day. Would you like information about voting in person in case your ballot doesn't arrive in time? So we'll try to tailor that conversation to people depending on what information is available in the voter file. Every state handles it differently and whether we've talked to that voter before. So really good question there. Um, Wonderful, excuse me. I think, um, Shannon, if you have one more question, I'd say answer it and wrap it up. I'm sure there will be more questions and outreach and I know we'll be sending out some materials to everyone who attended today so they can easily find the Environmental Voter Project and, and possibilities. Uh, do you have one more? Or? The last question I see in the chat was someone who's asking um, for information about social media. So uh, I can pop the exact links in the chat as other folks are talking, but um, you can find all that on our website as well. There's a spot at the bottom with all of our social media links. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for everything you do. Thank you all for having me.